Um, I would like to begin by thanking the St. Phoebe Center uh, and all of our wonderful hosts here at St. Paul Church for inviting me to participate today. It's truly an honor to be in your company. The theme of our gathering is renewing the diaconate. And there's simply no simple response to the question on how to renew the diaconate. Today we're faced with the resurgence of trends that can alienate the scholar who's faithful to the church. Historically, orthodoxy is no stranger to theological speculation or disagreements that occur amongst theologians. Deliberation on articles of faith central to the life of the church can be healthy. We call the creed we recite together at baptism and divine liturgy Nicene Constantinopolitan because the title tells us something about its progeny. We inherited this creed from the fathers of the church who established its articles through a process of deliberation. And as any attentive student of church history can tell you, that process was not always smooth or seamless. Now there's a difference between healthy deliberation on matters related to faith and order within the church and dismissing the possibility of discussing church issues because of a lack of trust in scholars who are faithful to the church. The tendency to dismiss conversations about church issues is fueled by an inherent distrust of theologians who are trained in academic disciplines. The rationale for dismissal is the assumption that an academic proposal for the church poses a threat seeking to destroy the church and her unity, or to replace a traditionally ecclesial form with one established in the so-called secular world. I have two examples that I believe illustrate this point, and more importantly, refer us to the larger point of this lecture, which is the role of bishops and synods in renewing the diaconate. In my first example, I'd like to consider the liturgical reforms considered by the Orthodox Church, which was the topic of our lunch discussion. Reforms such as reciting prayers allowed for the people to hear or reconfiguring the internal configuration of sacred space to maximize and encourage lay participation in and comprehension of the liturgy has had both proponents and opponents. The rationale underpinning appeals for reform has been research into historical models belonging to the Orthodox tradition and the recovery of an ecclesiology that honors the priesthood of the laity without confusing it with the ordained ministry of bishops, presbyters, and deacons. One narrative seems to dominate the arguments of the opponents of liturgical reforms. I have heard and documented the claim that the rationale for reform is inspired by either Vatican II or secular values of egalitarianism, or in some cases both. For example, secularism entering the Orthodox Church through the influence of Vatican II. Opponents of the implementation of reform argue that each and every church practice, structure, and liturgical office has been handed down to today's church through an organic process of growth. If we were to implement liturgical revision, major surgery would be required to the organism, which is the church, and that surgery can be construed as a threat to distort orthodoxy, much like any cosmetic surgery performed today alters the appearance of the person on whom it has been performed. Now, I'm sure that my description of this environment doesn't surprise you, and perhaps some of you are well versed in navigating this bumpy road, but here's how the environment applies to the question of bishops, synods, and testing the spirits on the renewal of the diaconate. How do we assess the status of the life of our church and ordained ministry in our time? I confess that I've been persuaded by the theologians who believe that specific historical and political conditions prevented the Orthodox Church from addressing modernity and postmodernity until around the time of after World War II in select pockets of the Orthodox world. I wonder if we're aware of the degree to which we absolutely adhere to the forms that we have inherited from the previous generation. 
the parish with the priest as the one who offers mysteries on behalf of the people, tends to be the prevailing model of local community that we can imagine. Now, there's nothing wrong with this model, but it's also aspirational. Emerging communities such as missions must aspire to become parishes, and that will include a plan for purchasing land, building an edifice, which will then have a four-part required structure, sanctuary, nave, narthex, and iconostasis. Now, what happens to this paradigm in a time of shifting demographics, a mobile workforce, when one cannot simply count second, third, and fourth generations continuing to sustain the local parish established by the founding generation. The parish is not the only entity affected by the constantly changing dynamics of culture, demographics, and a mobile workforce. The people of the church are the ones most affected by change, especially bishops, presbyters, and deacons. In terms of the diaconate, and we've already heard this refrain so far this weekend, the form we've inherited is one in which the deacon has a beard, except for me, hopefully knows music, and is the master of performing the complicated rituals passed on from medieval Byzantium to today. And as we've alluded to, it's altogether another thing to imagine a deacon who might preside at some liturgical offices, bring communion to the sick, publicly represent the church, anoint the sick, console the bereaved, instruct inquirers, preach, essentially providing pastoral ministries in areas that complement the work of the presbyter and the bishop. Now, so far I've described two elements of our church experience that lead up to the crucial question of testing the spirits. We do live in an environment of mistrust of change. We often attribute it to external or non-orthodox sources. And sometimes we dismiss the possibility of reform on that basis. We treat the existing forms of the church as untouched by the progress of time and the shifting of political and cultural sands, rendering the existing structural forms fully capable of flourishing in all times and all places. These two elements of contemporary church life are fused by the way we understand and interpret history. If we accept that it's natural for church forms and ministries to adapt to changes caused by time and context without relinquishing the essential content of Christian life, which is located in the creed, wherever the body of Christ is assembled, then we can imagine a renewal of the male and female diaconate for the building up of the church and for the life of the world. If, however, we're convinced that church forms are timeless and it is society that needs to adapt and not the church, then we have no business pursuing renewal. In our times, bishops and synods have taken varying approaches to test these spirits and ascertain what is needed, as long as whatever reform is implemented is from the will of God and blessed by the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. I want to use the Moscow Council of 1917 to 1918 as an example of testing the spirits. The Moscow Council was perhaps the most celebrated conciliar gathering of the 20th century, outside of Vatican II, of course. It is likely that most Orthodox scholars were intrigued by the scope of what the Council might have contributed to the global Orthodox Church had it not been interrupted by the revolution fierce persecution of the church by the Bolshevik regime. The Moscow Council considered several liturgical reforms that had the capacity to breathe new life into the body of Christ. Proposals for reciting the Anaphora aloud and translating liturgical texts from Slavonic into vernacular Russian and Ukrainian were declined or deferred at the council, as was discussion on restoring the order of deaconess. For some Orthodox, the Council's failure to act on these proposals overshadows what it did accomplish, the restoration of the Patriarchate in Moscow. We should consider how the Moscow Council influenced the life of the global Orthodox Church before we declare its defeated proposals to be mere victims of history. The legacy of the spirit of the Council outlived the Convocation itself, 
and its work was continued by leaders who made new lives for themselves outside of Russia. Despite the absence of an authoritative call for reciting the Anaphora aloud, many church leaders encouraged the practice of reciting it aloud for all to hear. As we know, a practice advocated by Father Shmemen, by Father Kalivas, and others. The restoration of the patriarchate also provides us with a compatible parallel to our discussion on renewing the diaconate. In 1721, Tsar Peter I implemented a new form of church governance called the spiritual regulations. This form of church government temporarily abolished the patriarchal office and assigned an Ober procurator to be the state's liaison with the Russian church. The church continued to have bishops governing eparchies, and the bishops continued to convoke synodal gatherings, but for all practical purposes, the office of patriarch was paused for a period of just over 200 years. In his study of the Moscow Council, the Dominican scholar Hyacinth Destevel argues that the patriarchate was not actually restored, but recreated. The recreation of the office of patriarch was designed to strengthen the life of the church. The patriarch would strengthen and encourage the eparchial bishops to serve as a unifying figure for the church to be working together, while also truly representing the church to the state and all other entities of the world. And sidebar, imagine the meaning of the restoration of the patriarchate when the state, as the Russian church had known it, had completely collapsed and been replaced by an adversarial state, all the more important to have a strong patriarch. The Moscow Council also recreated the parish by strengthening lay participation in the parish and representation of the parish without compromising the priest as the proper head of the parish. Both recreations were based on lessons learned from the history of the church. For the church to flourish as the healthy organism of Christ's body, the office of patriarch needed to not merely return, but to be capable of addressing the turbulent issues of the times. The same was true of the parish. The bishop sensed that the people's participation in the life of the local parish was steadily decreasing. So creating a structure that brought the laity into dialogue with the priest was one way to ensure that the laity would not be alienated from the life of Parish. It's crucial to note that this recreation was not an innovation. The formal inclusion of laity in parish structures simply honored an older tradition of Russian parish life. Now, it would be misleading to argue that these recreations were successful. Our lens of assessment is certainly obstructed because of the severe persecution endured by the Russian church through the Soviet period. So I would adopt a cautious approach to assessing the impact of the council in Russia. The very first patriarch of the church in the modern era, St. Tikhon, left a legacy of vision and mission and shed the blood of a martyr and confessor. On the other hand, many scholars and analysts have argued that Patriarch Tikhon's successors collaborated too closely with the state and compromised the mission of the church and its influence on the people. I would argue that even the most negative assessment of the recreation of the patriarchate should account for the possibility of continuing to work on the ministry of this office. In other words, the historical act of recreating the patriarchate would ideally be the first in a series of ongoing actions aimed towards developing the ministry of this office for the building up of the life of the church. I've reflected on Moscow's recreation of the patriarchate because it creates a parallel for our discussion on renewing the diaconate. The patriarchate is a particular office of the church exercised by one probably selected from the existing pool of bishops. The task engaged by those gathered here today and afterwards is to consider how the church might renew the order of the diaconate. The Moscow Council provides us with a potential pattern on how to approach this task. I'd like to move on in this paper and reflect on three aspects of the pattern of recreation from the Moscow Council that we can apply to our discussion on the diaconate. First, 
testing the spirits. The decision to restore the patriarchate was not impulsive, but the product of ascertaining a need in the church's pastoral ministry. The Russian church didn't have bad leaders throughout the period of time that it was without a patriarchate. It produced intellectuals, saints, and strong theological academies. But leaders noted that the absence of the patriarchal office, able to consolidate the church and encourage the bishops in their local ministries, needed to be filled. In this vein, the appeal for the recreation of the patriarchal office was timely. Two, church-wide deliberation. The decision to recreate the patriarchate was not made behind closed doors in a haze of white smoke among a group of privileged monastic and celibate men. The decision was made by the council, which also consisted of lower clergy and lay representatives. And three, awaiting God's response. When the time to elect the actual patriarch arrived at the council, the church left room for God's choice by having the final selection made or not. The process of testing the spirits and pastoral ministry performed by our three major orders has been underway for quite some time. The results have been uneven because two prevalent patterns collide with one another. The first pattern is the one of continuity, and that's the pattern of us always doing things the way that we always have. And what this does is something that we've already talked about, placing an overwhelming amount of the ministry in the hands of the priest. And in many cases, the only role for the deacon in our current paradigm is to chant the lines of the liturgy appointed to him. Permanent deacons are both a rare and a luxury. And I know this from my own experiences. Most parish priests, when I go to visit parishes, with the illustrious exception of a few people in this room, don't know how to serve with a deacon because we are rare. Testing the spirits collides with continuity when we imagine how the diaconate might complement presbyteral ministry. In exceptional cases, deacons might teach, preach, provide spiritual direction, anoint the sick, distribute communion to those who cannot attend liturgy, and represent the parish or diocese in some official capacity, and perhaps even lead some liturgical offices. When deacons perform these ministries, the assumption is that the action was blessed as a result of testing the spirits, which is ascertaining the need for deacons to minister in these areas. The questions for bishops and synods is this. Are they willing to take the step of testing the spirits to identify areas of need in the church and determine how these areas can be addressed through diaconal ministry? As we have heard today, in certain pockets of the church, the diaconate has reemerged, and deacons do contribute to pastoral ministry in the church at the parish and diocesan levels. Is this a result of the outpouring of the spirit upon us? I'm convinced that it is. And I'm also convinced that the decision of the Church of Greece in 2004 to restore the order of deaconess and that of the Patriarchate of Alexandria are also fruits of the Spirit. The point here is that we must, as a church, be willing to test the spirits. There's plenty of justification for bishops to bless the study of renewing the diaconate to address contemporary pastoral needs, to train and educate deacons, and to ordain and appoint deaconesses to pastoral ministry. The second point is that making this move of testing the spirits will result in the recreation not only of the diaconate, but also of the presbyterate and of the episcopate. We must be willing to accept that a renewed diaconate sharing in the work required by Christ's high priesthood might not be an exact copy of the diaconate from the previous generation of any given era. And the same reality applies to the order of deaconess. Its recreation may not result in an absolute replica of the medieval version of the Byzantine order of deaconess, nor can we assume that the deaconess will simply be a female or the deacon a copy of the priest from 
Complementarity is sure to enrich the ministries performed by all the orders. Complementarity, not copying. Now I'll go to my conclusion. When bishops and synods deliberate, deliberate this issue, they have to bring it to the whole church. A proposal to renew the diaconate should be introduced to the church before it's implemented to avoid the perception of forcing an issue on the church. This is crucial when we reflect on the collision of forming candidates for ministry for the sake of absolute continuity versus truly testing the spirits. The only way we can conclude that the need for a renewed diaconate is real is through consultation of the whole church. Practically speaking, this must happen at the level of the local church. If anything is introduced for it to actually work and blessed by the Spirit, it must be received. If it has not been received, then it has been imposed upon the church. How can we all serve Christ and build up his body today? An affirmative yes, saying that we want to serve Christ. An affirmative yes to saying that we want to renew the order of deacon and deaconess is not a threat to something that we hold true. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. A yes to renewal is a commitment to obeying the will of God and raising up men and women who will proclaim that message to the ends of the earth. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. We have now about... Thank you, Father Alex. I think that there is an assumption that, and by the West, I'm assuming you don't mean California and Oregon, <laughs> but the, uh, thank you. Um, I think that there's been a presumption for a long time that the West has kind of been like fertile soil for this kind of work because so many of the intelligentsia who <clears throat> had feet in the council or feet in those academies uh, or perhaps had learned from those who emigrated to the West carried on and implemented without an actual council, uh, much of which had been lost in, um, by the council not being able to conclude its proceedings. And Destavel says that it wasn't only persecution of the church, but they, they simply ran out of money. They were being funded by the provisional government of Kerensky, and they didn't have the money to, to continue to get together to meet. Um, many of those proposals were deferred to attend to the most important business. Again, uh, what was that business? Well, replacing bishops who were being murdered and drawing up services uh, for the new martyrs of the church. So um, I think that what we've seen is if there's going to be a reflection on what has been done and where we go from this, is that we have to, and this, this is something where scholars can be really life-giving to the church, I think. We need to profile churches and to see exactly how those principles and ideas of the Moscow Council that have been celebrated. And there has been the claim made, I can't remember the exact publication, but I know I've seen it uh, quoted by at least two different scholars that it's Paris, London, the United States, and Canada in particular that are, are simply, essentially carrying on those principles of the Moscow Council, especially the idea of a conciliar church, that <clears throat> there has to be some assessment of saying, what has been done over a longer period of time. How has it been received? How have we received it? We need an, we need an assessment. And don't perhaps agree with everything in the Moscow Council, but then in other areas, they, they do agree. And I think that that's what happens in conciliar gatherings, is we're for this, but we're not for this. Uh, or, for example, I think on the vernacular, there was a lot of momentum and an extremely great amount of work done in translating the liturgical texts. Uh, from Slavonic into both Russian and Ukrainian. And the only reason it was deferred was by the patriarch himself because he wanted to reconcile the old believers to the church. And so uh, you look at how far behind uh, 
the church is and, and not taking a positive step in doing that and taking those steps uh, because of situations that come up like that. I don't know where the most fertile soil is for this conversation. It's really hard to say. I mean, I think that there's long been an assumption that it would be the Orthodox churches of the West. Um, <clears throat> In terms of the Moscow Council, that's probably true, but in terms of the question of the renewal of the diaconate, I think we have a start with what we've done here today and the reports that we've heard this morning from Father John's lecture last night. Um, but, uh, you know, and I, I don't have any inside information, perhaps others here do. If we look at the uh, situation in the Patriarchate of Alexandria, perhaps there's something that we can glean from that situation and on why is there a need and such an urgent need. And from what I've been hearing, a, a very serious, certainly not uh, a trite consideration of why deaconesses need to be appointed and to go and to perform that ministry in the patriarchy. And so why is that for us? I don't have a ready answer for that, but we need, in, in our case, we need to assess. And uh, in many ways, that assessment is already Line Thank you for your talk. Um, speaking from one who grew up in the church and actually has seen quote unquote permanent deacons all my life, it's not a novelty. Um, in this case, these were men who never aspired to the presbyterate and, in fact, not only um, functioned as a, a litur in the liturgical capacity, but also did actual diaconal ministerial work and were a vital, vital part of the parish. So, in some sense, it seems like, well, okay, that's some 50 years ago or whatever. And here we are, and to, for some people, it's like a brand new world. It's a brand new life, okay? And in terms of the female diaconate, it is, it's not a, um, a new topic. Uh, even in the Russian Council and previous to that, there was a great movement in Russia to reinstitute the, the deaconess, and we've had plenty of pan-Orthodox worldwide councils that have made the same calls, going back to Agapia in 1976. And actually, an official imprimatur from the Ecumenical Patriarch in, at the Rhodes Conference in 1988. So these are many, many years ago. So the question I have is for both the male and the female instantiation of the diaconate. What is the line between study and um, action? In other words, is it a, a failure of imagination because we just study things in the theoretical and we don't see them? And having seen this, that's why for me, looking at the male deacon, I'm like, well, of course, you know, it's a no-brainer because I saw it, and that's the horizon then has expanded as a result. And the same thing, I think, with women in ministry. There's plenty of women doing plenty of diaconal work. It's hit or miss because they don't have the um, authority of the church, and it's very precarious because of that, both in their reception and both in the fact that they're working in a parish and a new priest comes in and you know, he has a different idea of what women should be doing, and all of a sudden their ministry is cut off. These are realities. But, um, but my essential question was, what is that line, and how can we move from just the theoretical, the study of which has been going on now for, for in terms of female diaconate over 100 years, 150 years, uh, to actually moving forward? And it's not that there isn't a need. I, in, my, okay, in my estimation, there's always been a need, but we have to see that. So I'm, I'm sorry for the long-winded introduction, but that, just to get your uh, impression about how to I'll, I think there are two or three parts to my response to a great question. So the first major issue, I think, is that um, theologians, uh, scholars, people who have, who have been trained like you, like we have been trained, we've been taught to inform, to provide information. Um, we have not been instructed to reform. It is a Taftism. It is, it, it is a Taftism, but you see it quoted by Orthodox people all over the place. Uh, I can't ordain, you can't ordain, you can't ordain. Uh, we can't appoint, we can inform. I think the point is that uh, we need to have, in the, it, when we heard these testimonials in, in the most in the session right before lunch, those were incredibly powerful stories. And I, I think people don't know. I think they make assumptions based upon snippets that they read headlines that they just don't know that this is going on. And there is an energy in this room 
following those testimonials of this kind of work is actually being done. It's, it's holy work. You know, when I think about the formulary for the divine grace uh, that happens at the ordinations, so how, how can one argue that that's not part and operational of what's happening in the work that all of you described in that earlier session? Sometimes we assume that uh, if, if you don't have an official capacity with the church, um, even if you belong to the church, that you're not working within the church. And these perceptions of mistrust, uh, it, it's not broken all across the board, but there's no reason that there can't be this kind of a gathering where you have uh, formal professional presentations, but the hierarchy then is here. And there's an informal and an easiness of conversation with the hierarchy to, to gain that awareness to say that we're talking about these issues. It doesn't mean that there's unanimity. It doesn't mean that everyone sees uh, everything in the same way, but it does show that we can come together and perhaps talk about things and present things that people just didn't know about before that add new elements to the conversation. And so that, I, I think that that kind of dialogue within the church where everybody is involved, that was happening at the Moscow Council. When you, the, the, the other book that I would add in, in uh, addition to the one you mentioned, Father Alex's Balashov's book on liturgical renewal, which I hear is being translated into English. And there are examples of parish clergy, of lay people, um, gathered together in sessions to say that this is why we would like to hear this prayer aloud. This is why we would like to know why the gates are closed at this point in the liturgy, because what is happening in there that we can have access to it. And, you know, I don't, I don't, I'm not going to say that they all agreed, because that's not how meetings work, you know, that everybody got along. But, it, but to actually be able to assemble and to be able to hear one another is really the most important step uh, of leading to action. And, and the third thing is that we're talking about something that's pretty big. You know, this isn't, I'm going to move an icon three inches in my parish, <laughs> which I've heard priests being fired for that before. <laughs> but this is, to, this is to restore an order. And why don't we just be honest about it? This debate is affected by what's happening in the Western churches with the ordination of women in the church. And there is a fear that occurs throughout the church that this is a Trojan horse for <clears throat> uh, feminist theology to come into the church. Now, is that the case or not? Why not? Why don't we be upfront about it and actually talk about it and talk about it in person instead of